Good afternoon and welcome to another WellConnect Wednesday session. We are happy to be with you here again and thank you for joining us today. Our topic today is risks, screening, and treatment of prostate cancer. And we have Dr. John Francis with us from CRH Urology. And Dr. Francis, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we dig into it, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely, thank you very much for having me. Uh, so I grew up in Chicago, and uh, for most of my life, academically, I uh, went up and down I-80. Uh, I did undergrad at John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio. For medical school, I went to Rush Medical College in Chicago, and then back to Cleveland for residency um, at University Hospitals, Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. Uh, there, did a year of research in urologic oncology, uh, then I decided to go down I-65 and check out Columbus. Uh, and I've been here for three years and I uh, live here with my wife and uh, daughter and son. Great, well, we are elated to have you. So thank, thank you, you for coming down thank our you. way. Um, so today we're gonna talk about prostate health. And before we get into the scary cancer word, I thought we might back up a little bit. And um, you know, whenever we have a specialist such as yourself, we like to talk about the connection between primary care and just general preventative screening and the importance of that and the connection that you make to a patient's primary care provider when there is a need for a referral and all that. So let's kind of start with, just in general, um, for men, for your target audience, what kinds of um, questions, awareness, conversations should they be having with their primary care provider? Absolutely. So I think when seeing their primary care provider, things that would be important to know, are we seeing any visible blood in the urine? That is one thing that a urologist certainly should look at. Uh, we also want to know about how a man urinates, particularly are they having to struggle and strain more? Do they have to give more belly pressure? Do they have a weak stream? You know, I often ask guys if uh, you stood a foot away from the wall and couldn't hit the wall with your stream of urine, that's something that maybe a urologist should look at. Aside from that, a lot of men will also complain about not able to hold their urine, right? They may have to go to the bathroom every more frequently than two hours. And those are symptoms that we can certainly work with a man and kind of see uh, how well we can improve his urinary quality of life, um, aside from prostate cancer, which we'll talk about a little bit later today. Sure. And, you know, this can be kind of a sensitive topic. Mm -hmm. And so can you give us a, a, an idea of kind of just statistic wise, how many men of a certain age, if you want to say 40, 45 plus, are dealing with issues that may not, that may cause to prompt some of those questions? Absolutely. So anecdotally, we would say that the decade a man is in his life is the percentage of men that may have urinary difficulties. For example, 70% of men in their 70s, 40% of men in their 40s. Uh, so it's not uncommon to start experiencing these difficulties with urine emptying and urine storage as a man gets older. And usually it is related to a prostate enlarging and causing a blockage of the flow of urine. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I did a statistic I didn't know that mm -hmm. it's you, basically you're not alone. Absolutely, that, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so as we normally do with our Well Connect Wednesdays, we will be taking your comments um, after our brief discussion here. So go ahead and load those in the comments session, and I will field those to Dr. Francis here in a little bit. So um, this is a, a session that we're having. Also, we want to call out this is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. So really prompting a lot of discussions. We want to keep that top of mind for men. So let's kind of dig into that section. What are the risks? What are things that um, men and their loved ones, we often know wives and partners kind of maybe prompt some of that discussion Absolutely. and upkeep Absolutely. on your health. So what are some, uh, some things that we should know going into even before um, that makes someone more susceptible to these issues? Sure. Some big risk factors are prostate cancer, most notably a family history of prostate cancer in a primary relative. This could be a father or a brother. Another big risk factor is African-American ethnicity. Additionally, we know that there are certain genes associated with prostate cancer. So a family history of multiple family members who have cancers such as colon, breast, pancreas, skin, thyroid, these are things that should get us thinking about prostate cancer. Um, Prostate cancer typically in its early stages does not have any symptoms. The part of the prostate that has cancer most of the time is away from where the urine passes through. 
So 70% of the prostate cancer we see is in what's called the peripheral zone or the back part of the prostate. This is why historically men would have a digital rectal exam with your finger in your backside to feel for any particular nodules concerning for prostate cancer. So um, there are other cancers out there. I always like to use the example of lung cancer that's uh, very closely associated with an environmental risk factor like smoking. And while of course we do encourage men to avoid tobacco use and have healthy diet, get their exercise and their required sleep, not a lot of environmental factors are associated with prostate cancer. It's typically your family history and your ethnicity. Okay, that's interesting because is there are there certain symptoms? Can maybe kind of maybe I should back up a little yeah, bit and yeah. explain to us on a high level what does the prostate do, and Absolutely. therefore are there um, symptoms that that we can walk out look, look out for regarding that? Or yeah, okay. So essentially, the job of the prostate it helps in reproduction. So it provides sperm the nutrients that they need to survive in the female genital tract. It sits underneath the bladder, and urine has to go through the prostate, through the center portion of it, before it comes out of the penis and then into the toilet bowl. So once a man is done with his reproductive years, the prostate really doesn't serve much of a purpose. Um, it can make urination difficult, and of course it is an organ uh, that in one in eight men uh, can develop cancerous growths. Wow, oh, yeah, and that was a great, I was going to ask you about the statistics that we're looking at here, and mm -hmm. do they go up with age, or um, it, it, what else are we looking at? How common yeah. is this? Yeah, yeah, very common, as we mentioned. One in eight men will have a diagnosis of prostate cancer at some time in their life. One in 10 of those men who have been diagnosed with cancer will be under the age of 55. The average age of diagnosis is about 66, you know, for men who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And many men will often hear and will often say that you're very likely to die with prostate cancer and not of prostate cancer. So certainly as a man gets older, the chances of prostate cancer get greater and greater. The question that we always pose is what is a man's life expectancy, quality of life, and what is the risks to benefit of doing screening and treatment for men with prostate cancer risk? Okay. Is there a prompt of, you know, a certain time, now, symptoms aside, but is there a suggestion that you would have for patients of when they should start talking with a provider about this? Is there a oh, prompt? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think one thing to note, too, so the way that we screen for prostate cancer is with a blood test called PSA, and that's called, uh, stands for prostate-specific antigen, and it's a protein that's found only in the prostate. And PSA screening first came about in the 90s. And when it first came out, we found it was a great screening tool for prostate cancer. And, and if it was high, these men were going for a biopsy. And what we found in the 90s and early 2000s was that we were treating a lot of prostate cancer, some of which may not have been lethal or causing a man death if left untreated. And because of that, we were getting a lot of side effects that were undesirable with prostate cancer treatment for no survival benefit. So what happened in the mid-2000s was that there was a very extreme recommendation based on an article that came out that didn't have appropriate data that said, we're no longer recommending prostate cancer screening for patients. And that was probably for about a five to seven year period. So there's a whole generation of people who trained medically who were taught in their training that we don't screen for prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Flash forward to the early 2010s and urologists were now seeing more men in their offices with more advanced prostate cancer that could have been detected at an earlier stage. And from then, we kind of went into different screening recommendations uh, that we're you know, more than happy to go over with today. And you know, we certainly will get to mm -hmm. uh, to talk about when a man should talk to their family doctor based on their family history. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and, and do that yeah. then. I think it's a great part. And I, I know we had mentioned symptoms before. Are there other physical symptoms outside of family history? Yeah, generally for prostate cancer in its early stages, there really aren't that many symptoms. Um, PSA is gonna find cancer maybe seven to eight years before a man would ever notice any particular symptoms. 
you know, as we discussed, uh, urinary symptoms are typically a later and more advanced prostate cancer side effect. And then, of course, if the cancer were to become very advanced before detection, you could have bone pain, bone fractures. Uh, so really, the PSA has been great. It's, it's been something that we can detect prostate cancer early before symptoms even develop. Okay, great. So yeah, let's talk about the screening options and, and what you recommend. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the recommendations would be that for a man under 40, regardless of family history, there's no need to get a PSA blood test. Starting at age 40, if you are in what we would consider a high-risk category, and you know we briefly touched on those, they would be men who have a positive family history, African-American men, or men with a significant family history of cancers that we mentioned, breast, pancreas, colon, thyroid. They should get PSA screening starting at age 40. The official recommendation is average risk men. That would be any man that doesn't meet any of those high risk criteria should get their first PSA at age 55. I usually will encourage men if they're in their late 40s, early 50s, consider an early PSA blood test. If it's normal, you can think about getting it every two years. And then from age 55 to 70, we generally recommend yearly screening. Now, if you're 60 years old and your PSA is less than one, less than 1% chance you'll die of prostate cancer. The guidelines recommend we stop screening at age 70. And they base that on the fact that if your PSA has been low up until age 70, the odds of death from prostate cancer are pretty low. Uh, but I usually counsel men that I usually like to extend it until they get to the point where they have less than 10 years of life expectancy. And that can be a difficult thing to calculate, but for most men, that would fall somewhere in their mid-70s, provided the PSA is at a low value. Okay, sure. And so uh, can you walk us through kind of how that might work for a patient? Um, and we'll talk about that average. We'll just use that oh, average yeah. category. Yeah. So um, they have a prim primary care provider. How do they make their way to you? How does that referral process work? Absolutely. So the referral process from the primary care physicians in the community and surrounding communities works uh, very efficiently. They'll put an order in our electronic medical record. Our office will get it. And our staff is usually pretty good about contacting people uh, very quickly. Uh, to get that initial appointment scheduled. And if the appointment is for PSA elevation, we'll certainly have a talk about what their number means, what's average. And what I like to do, we have calculators available that can predict the odds of cancer um, on a biopsy based on demographics. That would be your ethnicity, your PSA, um, your um, family history and whether or not you've ever had a prior prostate biopsy. And that helps patients decide if they want to go for a biopsy or if they want to follow it closely with a blood test in a couple of months. Okay, great. Yeah, it's good to know kind of how that process works yeah, before you absolutely. get into it. So let's skip ahead to treatment before yeah. we take some questions and we're getting a few in there. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when we think about treatment options ahead, it typically with cancer, you know, it doesn't become relevant until it's in front of you. But it yeah. is good to know the capabilities that, that we have at CRH. Oh, and, absolutely. Um, and absolutely. so talk a little bit about the options there. So the great thing about CRH is we can offer a man any particular treatment he wants for prostate cancer, and we have the support for any stage of his disease process. So from the urology side of things, the typical standard of care is the da Vinci robot. Now this is a minimally invasive surgery to remove the prostate. Incision for most men is only about two to three inches at the largest with a couple small incisions. And the majority of men will go home the same day after their surgery. Some men may not want to have surgery to treat their prostate cancer and we also have radiation therapy where they will be shooting radiation to the prostate and that is with uh, Dr. McMullen and Dr. Um, Henderson over at the Cancer Center in Radiation Oncology. So some men prefer that as an option for treatment. And then for more advanced disease, our colleagues in medical oncology, Dr. Wagner and Dr. Icklock, they can help a man with different chemotherapy options, everything from oral medications to traditional IV chemotherapy. So we have the, the full gamut of support to give everybody the best standard of care for prostate cancer management at CRH. Yeah, absolutely. And you're having 
the, that continuum of care discussion among all of the different points of view that mm -hmm. you as, as providers, providers and specialists bring to the table. Absolutely. Kind of right here in town, which is great. Yes, so. yes. And I would be remiss um, not to call out the uh, sponsor or the, the theme of our session here of WellConnect. So if you do not have a provider, if you have questions about finding a provider or a specialist, please reach out to one of our connection specialists and they will work with you to find a provider that fits your needs best. Um, so we'll go ahead and just kind of start fielding some questions. Um, I have one here about specifically about PSA. So you mentioned um, the number associated with that. What, I guess, what is the threshold for what's a normal PSA mm -hmm. and what is concerning? It varies with age. So for a man in his 50s, anything above two and a half is more concerning for a potential for prostate cancer. In a man's 60s, historically, we've used a value of four and higher. Uh, some of the literature in Europe uses three as a threshold. Now, when a man gets into his 70s, we often say that somewhere around six may be considered normal. But we also take into effect what the PSA has been doing over a couple of years. So if somebody's been riding steady at a PSA of one and auto automatically jumps to six, uh, to me that's a little bit concerning and does require more investigation than somebody who may have had a six PSA for the last five years. Okay. And I have a question here from the messages, too, which is always nice. Um, are there things that men can do to prevent prostate cancer that are related to sexual dysfunction? It or sounds like the question is more so if a man has prostate cancer diagnosed, um, how can they optimize their sexual quality of life? Because uh, certainly with radiation or surgery, it does impair the quality of men's erections. We, we uh, know that uh, about a third of men are going to have the same quality of erection before and after treatment. So the way we try to optimize this is we look for a combination of medications. We start with the oral medications like Viagra or Cialis, and we want to give the penis robust blood flow so that tissue doesn't kind of shrivel away. And then we kind of work with a man to see how invasive he wants to be with sexual function. You know, you can talk about everything from vacuum devices to draw blood into the penis. You can talk about shots into the penis to give yourself an artificial erection. Uh, the end-all be-all, if a man is motivated, they consider a surgically implanted inflatable device to help with erections. So, you know, it, it's all talking with the patient, letting them know that even after surgery or radiation, we do have a rehabilitation program that we like to put people through so that we can optimize their sexual function after cancer treatment. Okay, great. Is there a link between testosterone and prostate cancer? Yes. Actually, there is not. So men can have testosterone supplementation, and we will follow their PSA as they're getting that testosterone therapy. There's never been a direct link between the two. The confusion comes, the last urologist to win the Nobel Prize won it in the 1950s because he identified a link between testosterone and prostate cancer. Now, it is true that if a man has prostate cancer, testosterone can fuel the growth, but the cancer already has to be there. And for more advanced cancers, it's often recommended we give drugs to block testosterone, bring it down to very low numbers. And even if men have lower than normal testosterone, but not quite at zero, it's our thought that the receptors on a prostate cancer cell are already maximally stimulated by the testosterone. So in well-treated prostate cancer, we have no problems giving testosterone therapy. And we know that testosterone by itself, with no cancer currently present, is not a risk for developing prostate cancer. Okay, thank you. I have another one kind of back to the treatment section. Um, how, what is typically the downtime after surgery? Absolutely. So we mentioned that most men will stay in the hospital for about less than 24 hours. Most men will go home with a catheter for seven to 10 days. That's just to facilitate healing. After we remove the prostate, we have to sew the bladder to the urethra, 
and we want that to heal well before the catheter comes out. I typically tell guys when they go home from surgery, they shouldn't lift anything over 20 pounds for two weeks. And then I usually will tell them that they can do all of the things that keep them out of the nursing home. They can cook their own food, they can dress themselves, they can shower, uh, they can uh, drive a car. Uh, but I just tell guys no heavy lifting for about two weeks. Okay, let's see, that one we already answered. Okay, um, it, do, you re, do you need a referral to your office? Yes, okay. uh, in general, you, you do need a referral from your family doctor. Um, yeah, so I would, I would just talk to your family doctor about that. Um, if you don't have one and you are of the age where prostate cancer screening uh, is a risk, and you know, I, I would say you need to establish with a family care doctor for, for other reasons, you know, heart, lungs, blood sugar. Um, but yes, yeah, so usually, and, and that's for any specialty uh, office uh, nationwide, yeah, you typically need a referral from your family doctor. Okay, great. And we mentioned that connection there um, through WellConnect if you don't have one. Um, and also, I can, you know, the benefit of that is those conversations that only help inform you mm -hmm. as a specialist about, you know, what might be needed um, and maybe it's not necessary for an appointment, or maybe it is, and, and that conversation back and forth with you and the primary care provider yeah, just helps. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, let's see. I think that is all the questions that we have right now. Thank you so much for your time today. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, if we just kind of back up a minute, I guess, and just talk about, um, you know, men's health in general, you, you talked about how, especially with this, there aren't specific um, environmentally related factors so much, but what can men do, especially as they, as they get in that, you know, we, we talked about 40, we kind yeah, of hit that absolutely. 40 um, age. What things do you recommend that men just really be a, more careful and more purposeful with for their absolutely. overall health? So, you know, obviously, as we were alluding to, we do recommend that men have an established family, uh, family physician that they go to for yearly checkups and blood work. You know, I think things that are good for men's health in general, we first want to focus on cardiovascular health. Obviously, that is a big killer of men. And things you can do at a younger age in your 40s and 50s to help maximize cardiovascular health, 30 minutes of exercise per day, alternating between aerobic and strength training. And we do encourage men to have a healthy diet, rich in fruits and vegetables, moderation of meats, avoid smoking, alcohol in moderation as well. And I usually say a good benchmark for men in terms of their overall um, you know, fitness, you know, thinking about a waist circumference less than 37 inches. Particularly for men, having more uh, abdominal obesity is associated with more cardiovascular events, more risk of diabetes. Uh, so certainly if the weight's creeping up there, thinking about a good diet and exercise regimen is very helpful. Uh, and again, we can't stress enough, uh, avoid tobacco use and alcohol in moderation. I know the focus here is on prostate cancer, but two of our other main cancers that we deal with in urology, bladder and kidney, are directly related to tobacco use. And a lot of people always think that lungs are the ones that are affected by tobacco. It's just as much bladder and kidney. Mm -hmm. Bladder, fourth most common cancer in men. So. Wow, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. There's another topic for Well Connect yeah. Wednesday down the road. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, we really appreciate your time today, and thank Absolutely. you so much for the great information. And, and I'll give you one more opportunity. Anything else you want to stress with um, with our viewers on, on this topic of Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would say that by the time a man comes to see the urologist, they've already seen their primary care doctor first. They've already had that PSA blood test obtained. And you know, we mentioned that there's um, a generation of doctors that really didn't get the updated PSA recommendations. Um, so I would say that you know, when you do see your family doctor for your yearly visits, ask about it. Ask, is prostate cancer screening appropriate for me? Or, you know, I'm of the age, I'd like a prostate cancer blood test, uh, and your family doctor shouldn't have a problem ordering that. And, you know, if it's elevated or abnormal, we are more than happy to have a man come to our clinic, talk to him about what the numbers mean, and how we can best look at them going forward. That's a great tip. Pro being proactive about your health and not being, you know, afraid or concerned to ask a question 
providers are there, they appreciate that. Absolutely. I'm sure. So, okay. Yep. Well, I think that'll do it for us. Thank you so much. Awesome. And uh, that's all we have today for Well Connect Wednesday. Thank you.